Welcome to another episode of That Betting Show for August 2nd, 2019, your one-stop shop for all your sports betting needs. He's Teddy Severanti. Give him a follow on Twitter at Teddy underscore covers. I'm Donnie Seymour at Right Side VP. The penalty-filled preseason is here, Teddy. And how about those Rays knocking down the Red Sox once again and the Dodgers hit cruise control. But let's get to the hot topics right off the deck. The NFL is back in our lives. And Teddy, I got to tell you, I watched a lot more of this game than I actually thought I would. Late fourth down touchdown conversion wins it for Denver. Ripping the win free ends up being the game winner on a fourth down conversion for the 14 to 10 win. Now coming down the stretch, look, a lot of times we're talking about this game because it's the opening preseason game, but we had some spread battles late in the game, a ridiculous pass interference call that extends a drive, an equally ridiculous holding call that calls back a touchdown for the Denver Broncos, but yet on a long fourth down conversion, it all came to bear 14, 10 final here. It had everything down the stretch. If you were a gambler here, Teddy. It sure did. It had a right side. The under was the right side. It had a wrong side. The over was a wrong side. And it had a good old coin flip uh, for the point spread. Decided, obviously, on a after a late turnover on a, was it fourth and, I think it was fourth and 14 from the 15 uh, uh, conversion. So it's just like the regular season where there's point spread shenanigans down the stretch. Now, the, there's a couple key notes here. Number one is obviously in the preseason, if you're betting on what the team's going to look like in the regular season, you're screwed. The only time you're going to see anything that resembles a regular season roster is eh, sometimes first quarter, first half of week two, and then uh, a lot of teams go a full half or more in week three. But certainly week one, all the games you're going to see for the next week, they're going to be a lot like the one we just saw. Penalty filled, offense struggling. That's the nature of preseason football. But note that they went for it on that fourth and 14 instead of kicking the game tying field goal. Why? Because nobody wants overtime in the preseason. And that's why the key number of three in the regular season isn't nearly as important in August as it will be in September. Those ones, those twos, those one and a half, those two and a half, those are the key numbers to make sure you get in your pocket. Threes, not as important. And that was clearly on display last night. No, Teddy, that was a pretty good call by you yesterday, bringing that up. But let's take a look at another thing that happened in the game. We finally got a look at that pass interference challenge call. Now, the one question I want to ask you, Teddy, because we know in Major League Baseball, and same thing with NFL, you know, per se a little bit here, is it's supposed to be used, meaning the instant replay, to overturn an egregious call. Obviously, it's a snapback move to the NFC title game last year with the New Orleans Saints and the Los Angeles Rams. But taking a look at it now, do you think you're going to get that same MO from Major League Baseball where if it's close they stick with the call in the field because the umpires made that play because some of these plays you could challenge but it looks like I don't think they're just going to say you know what he got a finger on him let's overturn it it looks like hopefully they're going to use that only to overturn the egregious pass interference or miss pass interference calls in theory you know once you start putting more power into hands that are outside the players and the refs on the field you get more randomness and more shenanigans one would hope that we would see, and the concept of replay from the beginning is that when they get it clearly wrong, we can fix it. But what we've seen across sports is it's not clear and they still change it. (laughs) And that's the problem with replay. Call on the field, in my opinion, call on the field stands unless a clear overturn exists. Unfortunately, that's not the way it's been going in any of the major sports when it comes to replay. It, yeah, it should be interesting, Teddy, to see how it plays out. But it's nice to have football back in our life. Next week, we do have a full slate of preseason games. How about this, Teddy? Let's get right back to the baseball diamond. And, oh, those heartbreakers out here because it's never over till it's over, Teddy. It, you're down to your 27th out. There's no time limit here. And it struck yesterday. The Marlins beat up the entire game, down 4-1, to one, heading into the ninth inning. Sam Dyson, new reliever, comes in. He gives up three runs. They're lucky the game actually didn't end in the bottom of the ninth inning because the Marlins ended up having bases loaded as well. But it moves to extra innings, a walk-off home run. But how about this interesting part of the Dyson shipped out from Philadelphia? Obviously not the Phillies, but the San Francisco Giants were playing in town. He arrives one hour into the game, Teddy. Three hours rest at night. What a great situation to bring the closer in. End up blowing a game for the Twins here, Teddy. <laughs> yeah, oops. Uh, and that, frankly, that's on no one but the manager. You know, so while we like Minnesota, when your guy's coming in already, the game's already started. He's on three hours sleep and you throw him into a closing spot and he gets bombed. Sorry. (laughs) I mean, that's all on you. That being said, the very worst MLB beats are always on unders. Always. And obviously side yesterday, a tough beat. I think the total is the worst one. I mean, I still remember. I had to go look it up to see what day it was. 
That nothing, nothing game was nothing, nothing into the 14th. Mariners, White Sox, June 6, 2013, cashed over seven, uh, 10 and a half. Sorry, not over seven and a half, over 10 and a half. Nothing, nothing into the 14th. Brutal beats come with unders. Be aware of that. Take your Pepto-Bismol because you know sometimes they're going to come. Absolutely. Still got another 60 days or so left in baseball season. So get ready. They are going to affect your NFL round training camp edition here on that betting show for today, Teddy. Pro Bowl center out of retirement. How about this? Ryan Khalil, who retired from the Carolina Panthers, now heads to the New York Jets to try to solidify that offensive line and be that extra quarterback of the offensive line behind their young signal caller. Trade request, as we brought up briefly yesterday for Melvin Gordon. The Eagles add a little bit of secondary help. And also Lamar Jackson says, you know what? I don't think I'm going to have to run a lot this year or run as much as I did my rookie year. I don't know if that's going to be the case. And then Jerry Jones, we're going to have a nice little update daily like we used to do, Teddy, with Bryce Harper and Manny Machado. Zeke, yeah, you know what? I'm comfortable with the timeline right now. What? There's no pressure 30 days from opening day. It'll be interesting to see the rest of the summer. But that is your wrap-up around training camp. Teddy, what do you think around the league so far? Well, let's go through them one at a time. Khalil to the Jets. That's a big get for New York. It really is. And, uh, again, it's a team that's lined as a sub-500 squad. They got a good offensive line, maybe. They got a decent quarterback who looked good at times last year. They got a whole lot of playmakers, and they put a lot of money in their defense. Jets making the right moves, in my opinion. Melvin Gordon with the trade request. Well, what do you say? Running backs are who they are. Hey, you know, Le'Veon Bell did get paid for the Jets, but contracts like that for running backs few and far between. I think Gordon, well, <laughs> the Chargers will miss him, but frankly, running backs are replaceable. Melvin Gordon may well find that out. Philly continues to look like one of the deepest teams in the NFL. And you talk about the uh, addition of Cyprian. I'm telling you, when you talk about 1-53 to 53 on that roster, not necessarily the starters, but which teams can withstand injuries that inevitably happen, Philadelphia looks better than most NFL teams on paper. Lamar Jackson says he's not going to run as much this year. Do I believe him? Yes, I believe him. <laughs> End of story. You know, uh, of course, I, I, he knows he has to be a passer first. The Ravens offense is designed for him to pass first. They've got playmakers in place for him to pass first. We'll see how it works out. And, of course, Jerry Jones talking about Zeke. Hey, holdouts for veterans are a part of every single training camp, every single preseason. And part of it is because the veterans don't want to be there. It's hard work. Zeke taking advantage of his opportunity to, I'm sure he's working out at home. He's not sitting there, you know, drinking beers on the porch. He's busting his butt, getting ready for camp, but he's doing it outside the team facilities, which is a lot more fun and a lot less claustrophobic than many of these training camps. College football, Teddy, coming up in just a few weeks away. Your top 20 college football preview right here on That Betting Show. Today, we're going to talk a little Oklahoma Sooners football. How about this? We were talking about 50 to 1s, 100 to 1s, 150 ones to win the NCAA title. Now we're getting a legitimate shot here with the Oklahoma Sooners opened up at 15 to 1 to win the 2019 NCAA title. The Sooners team total this year, Teddy? 10 and a half minus 130. OU finished up last year 12 and 2, 8 and 1 at the Big 12. Lincoln Raleigh comes into his third year at the helm, sporting a pretty good record there at 24 and 2. Back to back Heisman winners. He's going to try to make it a third this year, Teddy, with Jalen Hurts coming over from Alabama. Plenty is left at wide receiver, as we see last year. Hollywood Brown goes to the NFL. No shame there. C.D. Lamb averaged 17.8 yards per catch, excuse me, per catch with 1,158 yards on the season and a couple of really good running backs here. The schedule, when you look at it, Teddy, doesn't seem that daunting overall when you go over it. West Virginia's at home. TCU's at home. But then you do have that Bedlam rivalry in Stillwater a little bit later in the year this year. But Oklahoma, hey, 15-1 to shot, legitimate shot at winning the national title this year, Teddy. I mean, the Big 12 is deep. There's going to be plenty of tough games for Oklahoma. They're not a bunch of pasties. They're going to be running over uh, like you see in some conferences uh, in a college football. But, you know, we're talking about a truly elite program, 11 wins or more each of the last four years. But you look at the ATS marks, 7-6, and 8-6, and 7-7 and seven and seven last three. They're winning all these games, but the markets aren't sleeping on the Oklahoma Sooners from a, from a point spread value perspective. This is not an undervalued commodity type of team. Now, obviously, you talk about Jalen Hurts. Look, it worked with Baker Mayfield. It worked with Kyler Murray, the two guys who went at the top of the NFL draft. Uh, now we're going to see if Hurts can have that similar grad transfer or you know the, the transfer coming in uh, type of success. I mean, the guy did go 26-2 and two as a starter at Alabama, but that was a very different offense than the one he's running here. Played well in the spring game. They have plenty of skill position talent. The running backs are loaded. The wide receivers are loaded. However, the offensive line is a huge, 
issue for Oklahoma going into fall camp. Four starters are gone. That was the best offensive line in college football last year. The lone returning starter up front, the center, he missed all spring with an injury. That, it, to me, is a huge question mark for Oklahoma. And when you look at this defense, this defense ranked 130th. That's dead last in pass defense last year. Last in the Big 12 in total, in total defense. Last in the Big 12 in scoring defense. You bring a new coordinator, Alex Grinch, from Ohio State, and all the quotes are, we can play defense this year. Cornerback Trey Brown, we believe we're going to be a totally new defense. There's nine returning starters back. So you have offensive line issues and a defense that might be a whole lot better. September, coming out of the gate, I'm going to be looking for opportunities to bet Oklahoma under the total. I think that might be totaled a good notch or two too high, given the defensive improvement and the potential offensive decline. Closer and closer, Teddy, to the college football season we come already in the month of August. The end of the month, we'll be partying. We'll be breaking down some of these games. And also, we'll be headed down to South Florida here, Teddy, as you know, at in uh, Hollywood, Florida, from the 18th to the 24th, having a little bit of fun down there to kick off the college football season, which that's Saturday night. Let's have those Miami Hurricanes and UF Gators should be going here. But let's talk a little bit about overnight line movers, the best place on the Internet to check those out. Of course, it's SBRodds.com. Matt's in the Mets. Line dips a little bit. The Mets open up minus 125 against the Pittsburgh Pirates steady. Now I'm seeing about 110s here across the board. A total of nine Matt's versus Williams tonight. Yeah, and this is certainly a surprise uh, line move. If you're looking at current form, the Mets have been red hot. They won seven in a row and the Pirates have been, I think, the worst team in the National League. Since the All-Star break, but the betting markets care about that? No, they're worried about the advanced metrics on the pitchers. And we saw a pitchers duel between these two same starters at City Field last weekend. 3 0 finalist uh, was part of the Mets' uh, current winning streak. Matt threw a complete game shutout in that ball game. Markets saying he can't do it again. His F is fielding and independent pitching and adjusted fielding and independent pitching, both higher than his ERA. The markets viewing Mets as the mess, as the mess, the Mets' worst. Starter. That's a tongue twister more than, more than what I thought it was. Absolutely, man. Matt's in the Mets there, Teddy. We'll get it right one of these days. Gaussman and the Braves in the line heads north. How about this? Braves open up minus 140. Now, the 160 range is here on SBRodds.com. Reds in the Braves tonight. Total of nine. Wood back to his old stomping grounds versus Gaussman tonight. Yeah, and the markets don't trust Wood. Uh, I mean, this is a guy. I'm Yes, he's returning home. Uh, but... We're talking about a guy who was acquired by the Reds in December as part of that big trade with the Dodgers. He had back spasms and basically sat all year. He threw on Sunday, last Sunday, and looked okay. Four and two-thirds, two runs, seven hits, one walk, four strikeouts against the Rockies. This is a tougher lineup than that. And, you know, Atlanta right now with their bullpen additions, there's some momentum on this team. The market's showing that with the Braves money coming early on Friday morning. Yep, Teddy, I would assume uh, Alex Wood not getting the video montage as he heads back to Atlanta tonight, but we'll see what happens here. And not much love for Kikuchi and the Mariners. They head on the road with the lines as high as plus 240, plus 250. The Astros sitting out there, minus 270, minus 280 in that range with a total of 10. It's going to be Kikuchi versus Miley tonight. Yeah, I mean, do you want to bet against the Astros right now? Ooh. I don't. Nobody does. That's why the line is as high as it is and why Houston's taking steam. Uh, I mean, uh, there, uh, there's been money coming on the Astros basically every game all week. You know, we saw it in all three games in Cleveland, heavy, sharp money on Houston. And we're talking about a team, even their defensive stats are through the roof. You talk about the additions they made, uh, the way they're playing right now, the market's white hot on Houston. No surprise they're taking money again today. Watch what you bet here on Sportsbook Reviews, That Betting Show. Teddy Boston and New York are going to meet again tonight. Red Sox and the Yankees. Looks like it's around 125, but checking on SBRodds.com when we look at a live look here. Somewhere in that 130s, 135 range is now heading north. 10.5 is the total listed tonight. 705. It's going to be live from Yankee Stadium in the Bronx. The Red Sox 59 and 51 on the season. Those Yankees 68 and 39. Paxton looks for a couple bounce back starts here. Rodriguez versus Paxton tonight. A really interesting quote from Dave Dombrowski, the Red Sox GM talking about why Boston didn't make moves at the trade deadline. Quote, we're battling for a spot. Hopefully we win a division, but as I sit here, realistically, we're probably playing first for a wild card spot. I look at that a little bit differently as far as what you're willing to do and the risk that you're willing to take. In other words, Dombrowski's basically saying, yeah, well, sorry, <laughs> we're not good enough. Um, I mean, it's the team that's now they've lost four straight since taking the first three games against the Yankees last weekend. Their pitching has been bombed in every game. 
during that span, allowing 32 runs during that span. They lost yesterday despite, what, a couple of home runs from Bogarts and Mookie Betts going yard. Didn't matter. They're not playing good ball. Now, Rodriguez has been ridiculous <laughs> in terms of, you know, 7-0 and with an ERA of 3.07 his last nine. Um, he pitched against the Yankees last week, three runs, seven hits, and five and two-thirds. None of his stats stand out as being a bet on Hurler, and yet the Red Sox win for him again and again and again. Of course, when it comes to Paxton for the Yanks, he's got his issues as well, particularly in the first inning. He's got an ERA of 11 in the first inning. He got bombed in the first inning against Boston, uh, what, just, uh, was that a week, a week and a half ago? Mm -hmm. um, yep. You know, gave up four home runs <laughs> uh, in the ball game. 10-5 uh, loss in that contest. Neither starter particularly trustworthy, but I'll tell you what, I'm not laying a price with the Yankees here. If Boston's going to win a game and snap out of their current funk, this is likely the one they're going to do. It'd be Red Sox or pass for this better. So with keeping with the theme of the show, you know, getting back to football, the NFL preseason action, why not start with a total, Teddy, that makes you seem a little bit like football? How about this one? A two-touchdown total in Colorado tonight as the Giants head to play the Rockies. Rockies favored minus 137, and yes, that total currently sits at 14 right now. Giants are 55 and 54 on the season. The Rockies 50 and 59. Anderson versus Lambert. Teddy, do we get an offensive onslaught in this one? 14. You need 15, Teddy, to catch this bad boy. <laughs> Yeah, you don't see a lot of 14s in MLB. So when you see a 14, you know there's a couple things in play. One, it's at a hitter-friendly ballpark, and namely Coors Field. Two, there are starting pitchers that nobody trusts, and that's the case for this contest. With obviously, And, I mean, we've seen the Rockies' totals really get adjusted over the course of the last six weeks or so. I went back and looked. The baseline total for them was 10, 10 and a half, 11, like six weeks ago at home. And then they went on this ridiculous run of on, uh, overs and overs and overs and 15 runs and 18 runs. And now all of a sudden we're seeing 14s <laughs> in Colorado. And now because the line has been adjusted so high, the Rockies five and one in the under their last six at home. Of course, some of that has to do with their lack of offensive production. These are two teams that went in way opposite directions in July. Colorado, six and 19 in July. They went from four games over 500 to nine games under and out of it. The Giants, who looked out of it, went 19 and 6 in July. And now all of a sudden, they're talking, well, maybe we can make the playoffs. So, from a momentum standpoint, there are two teams headed in opposite directions for sure. You know, for Hans Aidi, the Giants' uh, president of baseball operations, we value the present. We have a lot of faith in this group's ability to continue playing well, as we have recently. You know, then again, the quotes from Colorado, Nolan Arenado, there's a lot of baseball left. I feel a lot of things can turn around. I can't pinpoint it, but it's a collective group. We haven't played great. Yeah, no question. Um, I don't trust either starter. I don't trust either lineup. This game could be a lot of fun to watch, but honestly, I'm not betting it. Are you? No, but there will be warm weather, and if you are a fantasy player out there, you're probably going to want to get some of these lineups in here with those team totals, Teddy, approaching seven for each side in this one. Should, should be a lot of fun, but how about this one, Teddy? Tinseltown, Hollywood, heroes are made, stars are made. Is another star going to be born tonight? Dustin May takes the mound for the Los Angeles Dodgers. And their endless list of prospects, Padres and the Dodgers tonight, looks like right now at SBRodds.com, minus 160, minus 158 out there. Now, keep in mind also, Teddy, this line opened up a little bit higher, that 185, 186 range, so it has dropped down. Eight and a half on the totals now creeping towards nine at this point. The Dodgers, we know, prohibitive favorite, rocked the Padres yesterday. It's always interesting to see some of these star study guys come up and see how they perform. It's going to be Lauer versus May tonight. Yeah, I may, you know, the third uh, third round pick back in 2016 was rated prior to the season as the organization's number two uh, prospect. Uh, started the season at double A, from over to triple A in June, 3 0, 2.30 ERA, and five triple A starts. And now here he is uh, in the big leagues, pitching at home for the team with the best record in the majors. You know, six foot, six inch Texan. The guy looks like a monster. Uh, Dave Roberts talking about him. Quote, his makeup, his workload. The performance, we're all excited to see him make his debut. We're not concerned with how Dustin will handle this stage. The pulse will be fine. He can command the baseball. We just want to see how it looks. Now, there's a lot of talk that he's going to end up in the bullpen. I don't think he's going to go particularly deep. You know, he's certainly not going three times uh, through the Padres lineup uh, tonight. The question is whether he makes it through the second time uh, through the order. Um, you know, and the Padres, they're not playing well, <laughs> to put it mildly. We saw it again yesterday where things just unraveled 
uh, you know, midway through the ball game. They're two and five in Lauer's last seven starts. One of the two wins was a win over the Dodgers in L.A. last month. But I'm always concerned when a starting pitcher gets forced into an emergency bullpen spot and then he starts again his next outing. And that's exactly what Lauer's situation is today. He made his first appearance of the season out of the bullpen after 19 starts last time out because they were desperate. Does he get back into his regular rhythm and rotation? I'm not convinced that he does. And the Dodgers, certainly not a team on any rush to stand in front of. Daddy, we talked to anger yesterday on the pitching mound, breaking monitors, getting angry, throwing baseballs. Now we're going to take a little bit of a look at the other diva position in sports outside pitchers. That would be wide receivers. I'm going to go down to the Baltimore Ravens. How about this one, Teddy? couple little fights down here, maybe throwing a football. Jordan Lashley was cut on Wednesday after a wild week in training camp, which featured him fighting two of his teammates. But my favorite part of the story, Teddy, tech catching a touchdown pass in practice and lofting one of those few hundred dollar footballs into a local pond. Didn't go over too well with John Harbaugh there. Well, Harbaugh's quote, we never cut anyone for fighting. OK, I, I believe that. That being said, Jordan Lashley is not the type of prospect that you're going to be able to bend rules with. You know, sorry, kid. Uh, you may have talent. You don't have that level of talent. And Baltimore's, Baltimore's had a really good organization for, you know, the better part of the last 20 years. If you don't fit into that organization, bye bye And it wasn't necessarily the fights, but the ability to restrain yourself when it matters most. You do it once, okay. You do it a couple times and then chuck a ball into the pond. Yeah, you're not good enough to get that kind of treatment. We'll see you later, maybe on another franchise, but more likely up in Canada or in one of the minor football leagues. Yeah, I saw that report come out. I had to put that on the show here because just I can imagine Harbaugh watching that from practice. Like, what just went on over there? Oh, the kid just threw a football in the pond. Yeah, you know what? After this, let's make it real quick and get him out of here. Send the Turk over to his room. So always interesting. The same way it is here on That Betting Show. Thank you for tuning in for August 2nd, 2019. Your one-stop shop for all your sports betting needs. Once again, give Teddy Sparansky a follow on Twitter at Teddy underscore covers. And I'm Donnie Seymour at Right Side VP. We'll be back on Monday carrying you through a whole weekend of fun and getting you prepped up for the next week of preseason action. Stay tuned. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll catch you later.